Urban Survival Rifles Part 2. This is Part 2. Now, in Part 1, we talked about many things. So, if you're just listening to this as a standalone, you might want to go back to listen to Part 1. But that's okay. We talked about, in general, smaller or less powerful than the AR-15, the M4. I consider that kind of the standard. And I talked about that in the first one. I'm going to put in the intro part of that audio from the first urban survival guns and then we'll get into where we left off with the 300 blackout urban survival rifles you're in the urban jungle baby welcome to gunfighter life where we talk about guns gun fighting tactics survival ethics the right way with almighty god at the center judeo-christian values on that, first and foremost, I am a Christian. It's number one in everything that I do. Also, a little bit of a tailored bio to today's show. Now, <laughs> I live in uh, northern Idaho, not far from the Canadian border, not far from Montana. About as far from the rat race physically as I can get. But you might know from the bio, I've spent a lot of time in urban environments. LAPD. I worked regular assignments. Also worked fugitive recovery. A professional door kicker. Literally, I mean, hunting men. Man hunting is is may not be politically correct, but how else would you call? What else would you call fugitive recovery? Also, after my combat tours in Iraq, which were both urban and more natural environments, I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I was also a private contractor for a three-letter government agency I won't specify. I also was the commander of a tactical team here, CONUS, in the United States in a large metropolitan area to stop active shooters. That was the reason we existed, to stop active shooters on American soil. That was our bread and butter. So I should mention briefly, I, was, I joined the Marine Corps pre-9-11. I was in Kuwait waiting for the war to start. And I was blessed to be part of a little bit, uh, well, let, anyway, I'm going to leave what I was a part of. But I got to see Baghdad before collapse, during collapse, and post-collapse. I was there. I've got to see, and it was, you might think of it as a third world country, but at the time it was a nice modern city, Baghdad. Yeah, I don't, I, what it's become may be something completely different. But I got to see a modern functioning city descend into chaos, descend into a sad, war-torn terrorist state taken over let's say failed state now we left off with the 300 blackout this is not an episode about whether the 300 blackout is better or worse or or a better choice for the for whatever you think it's going to look like for urban survival but i will say it is an option and you could argue whether it's more powerful or less powerful than 556. Five, you know, if you cherry pick certain data, you can make it look more powerful, especially at close range. If you take it out to distance, and I'm not talking about crazy long range. I'm not not really into the super uber long range shooting. But you're talking like 200 yards. You can look, and some of those rounds are just lackluster. Especially if you talk about the 220 grain load, which is if you look at. I'm not talking about sectional density and stuff, but if you look at just numbers like foot pounds, you're pretty much turning an air into a 45 ACP PCC, which is 230 grains at just under the speed of sound. And the 300 blackout is like 220 grains, just shy of the speed of sound. And I know this is not exactly, but for nice round numbers, let's call the speed of sound around 1,000 feet a second. It's very much a niche cartridge of 300 blackout, but this is one of those niches, right? If your urban jungle is real up close and personal, you're not going to get a lot of long shots. You can kind of write that off. Also, you get a lot larger swath of loadings and as far as bullet weights go and things like that, you have a long, bigger spectrum. You have a larger spectrum of going all the way down from to like 100 and something grain, 110 grain, maybe even lighter, all the way up to 220 grain. It's like a much, much, much less powerful 30 out 6 And in that grain weight from 110 to 220. But you get like what I'm talking about with the flexibility of that round. Also, it has the advantage of using the same mags, or you might say disadvantage if you might 
consider it an issue with confusing them, but it uses the same mags in air, as an AR-15. It fits in many of the same platforms. Since it uses basically the same case blown out, you don't get a lot of the engineering hurdles that you get with other rounds you might encounter. Also, if you did want to go the suppressor route, you know, it's tailor-made for that, right? It's That's kind of, I think, one of the only big reasons, not that it's not good for other things, but the big reason that this cartridge even kind of exists. If you go back to, like, the... 300 whisper days but it is a real thing and it's not super uncommon and i think it's worth at least talking about a little bit on here which we have so let's move on from russia with love how about the ak-47 now many people think the ak-47 is the best survival rifle urban suburban middle of nowhere alien planet period carte blanche they say the ak-47 is it and i'm a big fan of the ak-47 i was well you may have heard a story if you listen before when i was in war i had a catastrophic failure with my m16 it's an m16a2 like catastrophic meaning like you couldn't fix it it wasn't a malfunction it was broke uh, i picked up an ak-47 i never had an issue with that thing or I'm not going to say they don't malfunction and have issues. They certainly do, but they are known for being a rugged, robust, reliable firearm. I mean, there are AKs kicking around Africa that who knows if they've ever seen maintenance, and they're still pumping out rounds. Also, and I don't say this as a good thing, but I say it to illustrate a point because it's true, there are child soldiers in Africa killing people. It shows you the ease of use of the weapons platform. It was made for a conscript army, for conscript soldiers for comrades that had little or no weapons experience. They're, I don't think Russia is a gun culture like ours. Like Kids don't, I don't think, grow up really with the sporting use of civilian firearms. It's made to be easy to use. Also, this is a big one I don't think a lot of people realize. The military variant is full auto, and it's full auto first. It was designed, from what I've heard and what I what makes sense from handling the weapon, is that it was designed to be a, su a more powerful submachine gun variant. As, as per... Soviet doctrine at the time, which is a whole different philosophy than our, you know, more accurate aimed being a good rifleman. I think that's further supported if you actually look up, and I did, I spent some time doing this when I was looking up the rifleman training, putting it together for you guys, the Soviet training with their rifles. <laughs> it's not impressive. And the Soviet weapons themselves are very impressive. Their courage on the battlefield is commendable. But their actual professional training didn't, at least from what I saw that was published later by the CIA, didn't seem too impressive. And that's just to show a difference in philosophy. It was designed to be a rugged, durable, service weapon. Easy to use. And for that reason, many people say it is the go-to de facto survival rifle. But again, the one you're going to get is probably not going to be full auto unless you're getting it on the some unless i'm not going to condone that but you're not getting the full auto version also there was a time when you could get really really cheap surplus 762 by 39 alas those days are gone i think unless there's some giant cold war stockpile we have yet to discover i think last i checked 762 by 39 costs more even for the cheap Tula Wolf ammo cost more than 556. So that time when you could stockpile massive amounts of of 762 by 39, again, I I don't think it's going to be cheaper than 556 here in this country unless there's like a deal or a special or something on it. But in general, I think it's going to be more expensive. So you've you've kind of lost that. Now, I will say I think that 762 by 39 is the best balance the best balanced intermediate cartridge is i think almost unarguably and some people will argue but i think if you just look at it you compare apples to apples like a good modern expanding round to a good modern expanding round defensive round in both not the cheap garbage fmjs in both but even there i think you'll see round per round 760 by 39 is more effective also better for barriers and stuff like that it's also a better crossover round for hunting medium game i don't know that that's going to be tenable in an urban suburban environment even the hinterlands shortly after a collapse but might as well mention it. and this is not 
a debate. I've done a whole episode on the AK versus the AR, but it weighs more. Not only does the weapon possibly weigh more depending on the configuration, but the ammo itself weighs more and the magazines weigh more, and that adds up. Just something to consider, but it is a rugged, robust, reliable weapon. The precursor, the SKS, I think is a fine survival rifle. I think it's a better crossover. I think it's more of a rifle replacement than a submachine gun replacement. I like the way it drives better, meaning I like the way that it handles. I like the sights on it better. I'm not saying it's a better battlefield gun. I'm saying from a shootability standpoint, I consider it more of a rifle. Like a proper rifle to be shot accurately. I like the SKS. I also like it in just a regular configuration, 10 round stripper clips. I'm not saying that's the best survival rifle for urban survival, but I'm saying it's an option. Especially there's so many kicking around. When we'll get to this later in the band part, for many people, those are exempt from bands where they can have those where they couldn't have a more modern semi-auto. So I'm going to throw it in here. It's a good rifle. And there's other 7.62x39 rifles, obviously. The VZ-58, but I don't think many of those are kicking around to be somebody's urban survival rifle. There's also the more niche rounds for the AR-15, and there are many, but two that are kind of more common are the 6.8 SPC and the 6.5 Grendel. Now their name denotes their bullet diameter. As you might imagine, they're a little bit bigger, a little bit more effective round per round. All of the things being equal to the 5.56. They're also a niche round. They're expensive. They're not easy to find. And they're probably going to be hard to stockpile. And who knows if you'd ever find any more. So there is that to consider. But they're, they're good rounds. Now let's talk about the big boy in the room. The 308 for urban survival. Now 308 is probably the best, most well balanced and available. Like if you count wide availability, wide use as a criteria, probably the most well balanced cartridge as far as it's many people's first choice for hunting. Still a main military round. Now it may not be a mainline infantry rifle round like it once was, but it's still commonly used in many things like medium machine guns, 240 Golf, 240 Bravo. It is still a thing. There's still who knows how many rifles chambered in. There are many common platforms. If you like the ergos and everything in the operating system of the AR-15, it was originally the AR-10. So you can move up to kind of the original platform, the AR-10 and 308. Now, it doesn't... It's not the same because... If you're talking about a direct impingement, unless you get off into some crazy proprietary stuff, most things on AR-15s will interchange. I could take a bolt carrier group out of a Palmetto State Armory and put it in a Colt 6920. It should work. For the most part, there are some exceptions, but you get the idea. There's no real one pattern or one standard for the AR-10. So you might see that as a disadvantage. You might want to stockpile some parts. But if you like the idea of the AR-15, but you want it bigger, that's, I mean, that's kind of the AR-10, right? Also, and I've said this before, a rifle would not be my go-to long gun for the end of the world apocalypse survival with no other criteria. But if there were certain criteria, certain caveats, and I thought that it was the better choice, if I had to pick a rifle, mine would be, I'm blessed to have a SCAR-17. I had it when I was professionally gunfighting as the commander of a tactical team. I used it in real life on missions. It's a fantastic rifle. It's rugged. It's reliable. This may anger some people, but I, I would say it's as rugged and reliable as any AK-47 that I've ever handled. And it is mine, sample size of one, is crazy accurate. I mean, it puts them in one hole. It'll, put, it'll make one ragged hole when I go to make a group to sight in. And it's semi-automatic, box-fed, 20-round magazine. It weighs 7.7 .7 pounds, naked. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal choice. The SCAR-17. I... I you know, sold many guns and saved up. I wanted one of those for, I think, for a decade before I got it. So, get it that not everybody is going to have a SCAR-17, but it's a phenomenal choice. There's also the M14, slash, more commonly in the civilian world, the M1A. Those are most commonly made by Springfield, but also you might be able to find a Polytech or a Fulton Armory, I think, are kind of seen as the creme de la creme of those. And they're good. Actually, my first 
maybe my first or second actual competition rifle was an M14. Phenomenal rifles. If you talk about being an excellent rifleman and having just the just superb iron sights, they have it. On the flip side, they're a little bit antiquated in that they're not easy to mount uh, optical sights to, like more modern force multiplying sights. And that you may not care. You may just want irons. And I'd say hats off to you. That's not a bad choice. But if you do want to mount optics, they're not the greatest choice as opposed to like a SCAR or an AR-10 where you can easily mount good modern optics. And the Cold War is filled with a with many full-powered battle rifles in 308. It was very common. So you got the Fowl and all its variants, which I don't want to dive into that. But the Fowl is a good rifle. Many, many variants. It's heavy. It's a heavy girl. As is the M14 we just talked about. They're heavy. Even if you talk about the shorter ones like the Scout. It's I don't. It's a scout in name only. It's not a scout in like weight per Jeff Cooper. It's heavy. It's a heavy gun. If you're looking for lightweight. The first two ones, which is I think a big reason I put them first, is the AR-10 and the SCAR-17. But there's the Fowls. There's the G3s, the HK-91s. Those are also known for being super rugged and reliable beasts of a gun. Some people like them. Some people don't like them. I can't vouch for how well some of the clones are. I'm sure it's like many other things. Like just because something looks like an AK does not mean that it's an AK. A good Russian built or like Polish built military AK is rugged and reliable. Pretty much as as much as a semi-automatic 50 to 75 year old weapon can be. However, some of the cheaper, sadly American made ones or American put together ones are not good or rugged or reliable at all. And I certainly would not want one of those. If if that's if I had my choice, I would take it if that's what I had. Not everything that looks like an AK is an AK. Not everything that looks like a G3 or an HK91 is that. An actual HK91 is a good gun. I think there is a lot of merit to the 308. I think there is a lot of merit to the 308 in any survival scenario. Ramp around is more. It's heavier, but ramp around is more effective. It's also good for things like stopping vehicles, which you could see why in an urban environment. That would be a great choice, even if even if medium-sized game hunting is not a thing very shortly after the collapse, which I say very shortly after the collapse, you probably shouldn't be running around anyway if you're staying in the city. You might be much more likely to get shot than to shoot a deer. But it's a good crossover round. Even without that, it's good for barrier penetration. It's good for, for many things. The 308 is a great, well-balanced round. It's widely available. As far as economy of scale goes, it's... I believe by far the cheapest full powered rifle round. It's got a lot of merit there. Although there's many more powerful rounds, it's probably where we're going to top out for today. I'm going to get into like 300 Win Mag or something like that, right? That's 308 is probably the top practical, unless you talk about 30 out 6, because that's just what you have, or you have an M1 Garand and that's what you have, then that'll work. But for practical purposes, the 308 the biggest one we're probably going to discuss today as far as power and range goes. Now, some of you that are fans of this might be screaming the bullpup the bullpup is the ultimate urban survival rifle and much like the 300 blackout or other niche things i think the bullpup is a niche that being said this is a niche where you might make the argument it's a big advantage without getting off on a tangent on bullpups if you don't know the bullpup just in basic terms moves the action behind the source of ammunition back to where the traditional stock would be. Meaning you can have a longer barrel with a much shorter overall length of weapon. Or you could have a shorter barrel with an even shorter weapon. Why is this important? Well, if you've ever done any room clearing CQB stuff, and I have done quite a bit, both done it and taught it, instructed it, that can be a real advantage. It is a real advantage. I will say that. I will say you give up a lot. And platforms differ, but the ability to clear a malfunction easily, the ergonomics of magazine insertion and things like that. Also, in general, you give up a lot on trigger pull, meaning most bullpups don't have a good trigger. And if you are familiar with most traditional rifles, you give up all that familiarity and continuity of training. And for me, that's a big one. For me, the benefit does not outweigh the detriments for me. I'm not saying it's a bad choice for you. We'll say of all the bullpups that I have experience with and the ones that I even know about, the IWI Tavor 
is a rock solid choice. I actually at one point had quite a few IDF guys working for me. Good solid guys. And if they wanted to run to fours, I let them run. Run what they're familiar with. Run what they're good at. I, I like to be that kind of commander when I'm given the liberty. I like to pass that liberty on to my men. Say, if you feel comfortable running this, whatever you feel is going to be the best to protect life, you run with it. There are other bull pups, but anyway, that's bull pups in a nutshell. I just wanted to throw that in here for those that that were waiting for me to talk about that, and obviously extrapolate that out to whatever round. There are bull pups in 308. There are bull pups in 556. Whatever I say about those rounds, just add that to the bull pup. Now let's talk about manual transmissions. All right, let's talk about not semi autos. Right. And why? Why with all the good semi-autos, something as reliable as an SKS or as accurate as a SCAR-17, why, why, pray tell, would anybody want a manually driven gun? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, it's what you can have. Malum prohibitum, right? You're prohibited by law. Maybe you don't even live in America. Maybe you live in Canada. So you're choosing between an SKS or a manually driven gun. And in some places, if it's a manual gun... Like, meaning you have to work the action yourself. There's no magazine limit. So do you want a five-round magazine of semi-auto? Or do you want an unlimited magazine? Not unlimited, because there's no unlimited magazine. It's not a video game, right? But you get the idea. You could have whatever your practical limit is in a manual. And by manual, I'm talking bolt action, lever action, even pump action, rifles. So that's a real thing, right? I would. I think you're better off with a rifle you're familiar with and that you can drive well, that you can handle well, that you know intimately. Like if something goes wrong, you just immediately go into immediate action, tap rack bang or tap roll rack or whatever it is. Second nature. And you get that by working with a gun and by training with it. It's better to have a gun that you're like that with than a gun that's perhaps better on paper that you have no familiarity with. Right? An AK, we talked about, is a great gun. But if you've never handled an AK... You've only ever handled an AR and it gets a malfunction and you don't know how to take the magazine out because you don't just rip it out and you don't just put it back in. It's not a straight remove and reinsert, right? There's a different manual of arms for taking the mag and putting it back, taking the magazine out and putting it back in. And if you don't know that, that's probably a worse choice for you. So there we go. Even if on paper it has more merit, if you don't know how to use it, it doesn't. it's not better for you. You're better with the one you're familiar with. And with that, many people are familiar and comfortable with, either because that's what they like or what they can have legally, with manual guns. If we look at a clear example of this, the Canadian Rangers, right? This is 2024. The Canadian Ranger gun was up until recently a Lee Enfield. And it is now currently still a bolt gun. It is a variant of a Tika T3 that costs a ton of money. But it's a bolt action 308. We just talked about the merits of the 308. Why that for the Canadian Rangers? Well, if you look at where they operate, their AO, their area of operation, it is, na- I don't want to say nasty as in like bad, but it's nasty as in like really austere environments, really cold, icy environments. All right? And would you rather have a bolt action with a reasonable rate of fire, much lower than semi auto, but a reasonable rate of fire that will actually work and that you can function? If the action freezes solid, right, you could dump some whiskey on it or do whatever you need to do to crunch that ice and get that bolt working again versus a semi-auto. So really austere environments, right? A good, good bolt action rifle is perhaps one of the most rugged actions. We talked about talked about AK still kicking around Africa for who knows how old they are, over 50 years old with no maintenance. I mean... There's Mausers kicking around, probably in in war-torn environments around the globe that are over 100 years old, that are still working. So, an illustration of that point. But with that, a good bolt-action rifle. I'm not saying it's better than a semi-auto. I'm saying, for the reasons aforementioned, it may be a better choice for you, or your only choice. A good bolt action 308 is not a bad choice. The scout rifle concept, which I have been working with recently, I'm not a scout rifle expert, but I have been literally scouting with it. I think the scout rifle is often misunderstood, and I may do another episode on it. It's not the best battlefield rifle. And a lot of people, I think, that that really love the rifle try and make it into something it's not. It's not the best battlefield rifle. It's not the best hunting rifle. But it's a decent 
decent practical rifle. It has a reasonable rate of fire. It's a workhorse. If you get one made properly, it'll be rugged and reliable. It's not overly heavy. Many of them have removable box magazines where many of the ones made for hunting don't. So something like that wouldn't be a bad option. Also, if we look at a lever action. Now, we talked about the new school kind of PCCs. If we talk about the old school PCCs, like a lever action rimmed revolver cartridge PCC. You talk about like a 357 Magnum lever action. Reasonable rate of fire, check. Also, not a rifle round, right? 357 Magnum is not a rifle round. Certainly out of a handgun, it is not. But when you put it out of a carbine, you get a giant bump up in performance. I'm not going to nerd out and bore you with the numbers here, but it's not 762 by 39. It's not a 556. But if you look at, honestly, most handgun rounds, and then you look at an intermediate rifle round, it's kind of a quarter mediate round. It's in between. It's it's definitely in its own game, like a 357 Magnum out of a carbine is definitely much more powerful and arguably with the right bullet selection much more effective than pretty much most handgun rounds. So you're not talking about like a 9mm or even the venerable 45. 357 Magnum out of a carbine is impressive. So you've got that, you've got a reasonable rate of fire. The ammo is more compact, not super heavy. Also, if you, not to get off into handguns, but if you did want to use a 357 Magnum revolver, you got the interoperability there of the ammo. And it's impressive ballistically. It's a decent medium-sized game and stopping round for humans in a handgun. And it's only more powerful out of a rifle. More powerful does not always mean more effective, especially with bullet construction, but you get the point. And 44 Magnum likewise. Everything I said there, but more powerful. The 44 Magnum. That's generally what I consider a little bit too powerful. You get to the point of diminishing returns in a, in a handgun for, for defense against humans. It'll certainly work, but you talk about in a carbine, you got a lot more gun there to absorb the recoil, and it's very effective out of a carbine. 44 Magnum is kind of a deer sledgehammer out to reasonable range for that, 125, 150 yards. So a manual, like, lever action. There are other old school PCC rounds, but those are going to be your two most common. Now if we talk about the most common lever action round, the 30-30, that is absolutely an intermediate cartridge. And rivals and exceeds, I think, round per round effectiveness inside, let's say, 200 yards. 5.56 and 7.62 by 39. Now hold on. Mostly, because most 7.62 by 39 is garbage ammo. Most 30-30 ammo is really good tailor-made hunting ammo, which means it performs much better ballistically. Could you hand load or really get a really, really premium 762-39 that would be as good as a 3030? Maybe. It would probably be even at that point. But for the ammo that most people are shooting out of 762 by 39, most 3030 ammo I think is more effective. 3030, it's I don't know if anybody could know what has killed more deer in North America, but it's as good a guess as any other. It's as good a guess as a 30 out six or the 308. It has put a lot of animals in the freezer it's also a very good defensive round we don't often think of it like that but again if you can't have a semi-auto or you don't want a semi-auto a 30 30 lever action is not a bad choice it's a great classic rifle now contrary to popular belief i don't think they're as rugged and reliable as people think that they are certainly not as rugged and reliable as an ak-47 or even a scout rifle if you've ever taken apart a lever action and how all the parts go flying everywhere and struggled to get them back together. Kind of like you might think you walked into the office of a Swiss watchmaker that had an epileptic fit. Just little tiny parts everywhere and all over the place. They certainly can be rugged and reliable. They're certainly a decent option. Just want to kind of dispel that myth. A good lever action 3030 for a good all around one and done carbine. It's also kind of got the gray man thing going for it. You know, a walnut furniture, not the new uber tactical m lock and rails thrown up all over it. If that's what you want, fine. But I'm talking about the classic blued steel walnut or stainless steel walnut kind of looking lever actions. They're classic looking. Like, you talk about gray man, nobody's going to be on edge. They probably won't be as much on edge if you're walking around with that thing as with an AK-47. I'm not saying you should care about that but i'm saying it is something to at least 
look at and decide whether you want to care about that or not. And then we have the, now you can also get a lever action in modern rifle rounds. We talked about the 308, 308, 30 out 6, full powered rifle rounds. You can get those. The OG of that, the Winchester 1895, was used in World War One. You can get that still today, I think, still made in 30 out 6. Now, it's not a cheap gun, so I don't think it will be a good choice for this. But you can get that. You can get the Browning BLR in 308 and many other cartridges. The cool thing about that one is it's pretty lightweight and it comes in a takedown version. So if you want a full powered rifle with a reasonable rate of fire that breaks in half for whatever urban survival consideration you might want to think of, you might not think of that as a great option, but especially if you are in a place where you can't have a semi-auto, a lever action lightweight takedown and a full powered rifle cartridge, not a bad option. And then if we stay with the full powered manual there is another the pump the remington 760 7600 full powered rifle round most notably in 30 out 6 but it came in other calibers and i believe it came in 308 detachable box magazine now it's not as fast to reload as something like a ar-15 but it's detachable box magazine pump action which arguably is going to be faster than a lever action but I think the rate of fire difference is negligible. But what's not negligible is from what I know about them and working with them, they are much simpler, I think, and more rugged. They're a great option for a manual operated gun if you want one with a reasonable rate of fire, detachable box magazine. And they're just a good hunting gun, especially if you're into like spot and stalk hunting. But the Remington 760, a good manually operated full powered rifle round rifle for kind of an all around rifle if you're talking about manual transmissions. And again, I'm not saying they're better than semi-autos, but I'm saying for a lot of people, it's a better choice because of what they can have or what they're comfortable with or the austere environment they may be operating in. Now, I don't want to be so arrogant as to tell you what I think your best option is. I don't know you. Unless you're a patron, I don't have a whole lot of interaction with you. It's mostly one way. I don't want to be so arrogant as to think that I know what's best for everybody. Tell everybody, oh, the best survival rifle for urban environments is an AK-47. Maybe not for you. Or if you don't get what I get, you're wrong. Like If you don't have a SCAR-17, you may as well just give up on day one of the apocalypse because your gun's just a jam matic pile of junk. Right, no, I don't think that. I don't believe that. I don't think that my choice is the best for everybody. I don't think that I know everything. Hopefully this was a good, thoughtful discussion on many good choices. And there's probably many more that I left out. So don't get mad if I left out, you know, talking about the Desert Tech MDR. It's a good rifle, I think. Obviously, Urban Survival Rifles could be its own podcast. I could do day after day after day of Urban Survival Rifles. Let's be thankful that it's a two-parter, right? And there is more to survival than just guns. Yes, I just said that. There's much more to survival than just guns. Which is going to roll us into the tactical tip of the day. And then the tactical verse of the day. One thing that I like to do on many of my go-to rifles, whether they be fighting rifles or hunting rifles, I like to put some line one gear on that rifle. For something like an AR-15, I like to get a pistol grip that has an enclosed compartment. There are many that are made like that. And put in something like an extra extractor, extra extractor spring. Make my own very small bore snake in case I drop it in the mud or the dirt. I can, Not an in-depth clean, but just a quick field clean to make sure the bore is clean. Perhaps a small thing of oil that will fit in there. Line one gear. Also for something like a bolt action 308 hunting rifle. Even if it has a nice butt pad on it, I sometimes like to take those off and get the removable neoprene or rubber ones that slip on the back. If I take the regular one off, I put that one on the back because it allows easy access. And a lot of modern polymer stocks are hollow. You can put a lot back there, and I'm not saying you should fill it up, but you can put stuff back there like an extra round or two of ammunition in case you lose or forgot your ammo. You, could, again, can put a boar snake back there. A lot of those, just a full-size boar snake because they're not very heavy. And you can actually give a decent cleaning in the field. Perhaps one of those small exchangeable utility blades, like a Havilon or an Outdoor Edge replaceable knife blade back there. They're light, they're handy, they're sharp. Just tape it to the inside of the stock. If you lose your knife, not that you can't make a knife, you certainly can, but having a literal razor-sharp blade 
to clean gain in the stock of your gun that takes up very little space and very little weight. Like, why wouldn't you do that if you're talking about a survival gun of whatever type? That's your tactical tip of the day. Put some line one gear if it's a go-to survival rifle of whatever guys. Tactical verse of the day. I'm going to give you a couple. Let he who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Right? That's kind of one of the reasons I do this podcast. To make godly men strong and strong men godly. Jesus told his disciples to have swords. Let he who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. You may not hear that preach from a pulpit very much, but you're hearing it here. The Gospel of Luke. The words of Jesus Christ. Let he who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. That's important, I think. It's important because Jesus said it was important to have a means of defense. That's not the end-all, be-all. Don't just focus on that. And I know sometimes we get analysis paralysis and focus on minute things. Have a means of defense, yes, because Jesus said so. I'm not saying you can't be a pacifist and be a Christian, but what I'm saying is there is no thought in my mind that you have to be a pacifist to be a Christian. But it is also written, give us this day our daily bread. Don't over-focus, don't hyper-focus on the gun. You're talking about somebody that's been a professional gunfighter most of my adult life. But also, hopefully, we're a realist. I've said before, I honestly can't remember the number of times I've been shot at. I, I honestly can't remember the amount of physical, whether armed or otherwise, otherwise conflicts that I've been in, by God's grace, not because I'm better than any of the men that didn't make it out alive, but I'm still here breathing. I don't know what that number is, but it's infinitesimally smaller than the number of times I've had to eat. You need food and water. So don't just focus on the gun. If you've got three different ARs and you don't have a water purification system, right, you got messed up priorities. I'm just here to tell you. Because if you look at even warfare, a big chunk of casualties in war are from dirty water, from disease, dysentery, things like that. If you got three ARs, you don't have a Berkey or something like it, right, in your house if you're talking about urban survival. You might want to be circumspect on that. Also, food. I'm a big-time hunter. I live as a neo-nomad. I do a lot of hunting and gathering. I also talked about carrying capacity. Right, survival math. Like, we'll take Florida for an example. Right, if you have four over 400 people per square mile, what's the carrying capacity of that land for humans? Four? I'm just going to throw out a number. Do you probably want to store enough food until that carrying capacity goes from 400 to 4? Whether through attrition or through death and disease or people leaving, fleeing, and mass migrations. If you plan on staying in an urban environment or plan on staying where you are, you had better have enough food to make that last until that carrying capacity equation gets rectified. How long is that going to take? I don't know. This is this Now we're moving off what I have training and experience in into purely hypothetical. A year, two years, five years? I don't know. But you're probably going to have to eat. And look at what happened to the deer population and many other populations east of the Mississippi, which is where most Americans live, during the Great Depression. And the Great Depression was bad, but there weren't a lot of people dying of starvation in the street. And look at what the population was in America in the 1930s versus what it is now. And then consider what's going to happen. So, probably wise to have some daily bread. Now, your last tactical verse of the day, man does not live by bread alone. The ultimate goal of your life should not be surviving. Right? That's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal should be eternal salvation. So again, don't have skewed views there either. Don't spend all your time thinking about beans, bullets, and band-aids. Because none of those things are ultimately going to save you. There is one God and one Savior, Christ Jesus. Salvation is in no other. Salvation is not, don't idolize anything. Don't make anything else your Savior. Not a politician, not an AR-15, not an AK-47, not stockpiles of food and ammo. Your Savior is Christ. Period. The end. Have a blessed day.